think I attended at least uh, two earlier events by the Blue Circle, and I've always been struck by the kind of people you actually get into the room, because it's, it's a very different crowd from the crowd one normally interacts with. Uh, because here what you gather is uh, people who are in the thick of things, people who have to take the tough decisions, rather than just the ones who are going to talk shop and go away. Uh, so then you start talking about and launching a platform like EVCon, uh, and you are one of the first to create a kind of platform where you have the kind of people you have in this room, I must say, it is hats off to you. It, 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 it's a great effort. Now, uh, I, I'm going to come at this from the larger perspective, you know, and uh, let me begin by from uh, February 2018 last year, when uh, Elon Musk launched the world's biggest heavy duty Falcon rocket in February last year. And the only payload it had was a red Tesla Roadster, which he shot, supposedly was suppo it was supposed to head into an orbit around Mars to show that EVs had come of age and that EVs were the thing of the future. That is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, and symbolically, what happened was that uh, he got uh, the, the, his interplanetary courier service got the address a bit wrong. And the Tesla Roadster at the moment is uh, 63 million miles beyond Mars, uh, headed towards the asteroid belt. That in a way is symbolic of what has been happening in the EV space. And we really need to take a cold, hard look as to what, what, what is it that needs to be debated, discussed, the changes which need to happen to make EVs a real possibility because the future is definitely emission-free vehicles. There, there is no doubt about it. You have to move away from uh, you know, polluting vehicles. You have to have vehicles which have zero tailpipe emissions. That is the future. Now, in many ways, as I said, you know, uh, the, the, the fate of the Roadster also uh, shows what has been happening in the EV space. See, electric traction itself is not new if you start looking at it. In fact, EVs have been far around far longer uh, than the IC engine. Uh, if you look back, uh, Robert Anderson made the, made the first crude electric car somewhere in 1832. That was 40, 50 years before the first IC engine was even invented uh, by you know, Otto Nikolaus. And the first, you know, after, in 1901, if you, if you look at the landscape of uh, New York, the streets of New York, EVs were the rage on the streets of New York. People preferred them to vehicles running on internal combustion engines. Of all the vehicles running on, on, on Fifth Avenue in 1901, there were more EVs than internal combustion engines or vehicles which, are, which were running on steam. Then, of course, came the Model T Ford. And the whole concept of you know, the, the, the kind of production facilities which Ford launched, the convenience of the petrol engine, and EV suddenly went to the, into the background. But the short point was that till 1901, EVs were the preferred vehicle for precisely the same reasons they're the preferred vehicle today. They were cleaner, they made far, far less noise, they were less smelly, they, you know, that, that was the whole idea of having EVs. And in 1901, Edison, was already at work on improving the car battery, which was the fundamental base which an EV would be running on. And he was hard at work. Porsche, the same gentleman who launched the entire range of you know, sports vehicles, Porsche was actually building his first hybrid around that time, something which ran on both EV, EV and uh, on, on electricity and gas. The whole thing was that since the beginning of the century, mobility has been, become extremely important. And even today in countries like India, as urbanization increases, urban centers have to bear far greater pressures. You know, as people start moving towards them in search of employment, livelihood, education, health, a host of reasons. Because transport and mobility fundamentally 
increase access to everything. Yes, they may be polluting, they may be doing everything else, but they increase access to all these factors, they increase access to jobs, they increase access to opportunity, they increase access to the fundamentals of health, education and livelihoods. And that is why mobility will always matter and consumers will always choose in whatever is the most convenient form of mobility. And today you're once again at a stage where because of various factors, the automotive industry globally is on the cusp of a major transformation. EVs are one part, but we are also seeing, you know, the march of increasing digitization. Every product and service that can be transformed into bits and bytes is being transformed into bits and bytes. The whole ecosystem of, of services is changing. And that has been incubating very, very innovative business models around mobility, around vehicle ownership that are disrupting consumer behavior completely and changing their preferences. So that is where the new opportunities lie. So Ola and Uber did not exist a decade ago. Today they are ride sharing services, you have autonomous vehicles, you know, robotic vehicles, electric roads which wirelessly transmit charge to them without the need for massive battery capacities. A lot is happening in this space. There is constant disruption which is just around the corner. And you are also seeing advances in storage technology, which has been the primary cusp of traction for small vehicles. As I said, electric traction has always been the more efficient, the more preferred form of traction. But trains have been, the, the thrust on electrifying trains has been around ever since. You know, no one prefers a train running on diesel if you can electrify it. And the future, yes, you will have lots of advance in battery technology. Probably lithium ion will, in the future, give way to you know, silicon and other kinds of batteries which come in. Graphene silicon interfaces will, will start coming into play. So there is a lot of work happening. Already lithium ion batteries you know, have an energy density which is three times superior to lead acid batteries, which is fundamentally bringing down the costs, increasing the range of, of electric vehicles. So, and that is the reason why this whole buzz around EVs exists. The conventional uh, passenger vehicle sales in 2018 were about 85 million units. And EV pass, you know, EVs had clocked in about 2 million in the same year. So there is, there is a change happening in consumer preferences. But you've had a automotive sector which has been dominated by the IC engine for over one century now. And it is a shift, it is a change, which is not going to be easy. No, there is, it's, it's not just a shift in uh, investor preferences, it's also a shift in consumer preferences, which is going to happen simultaneously. And there, there is a definite role for policy making. There's a definite role for interventions which can make sure that the transition to cleaner, automotive, you know, cleaner, better forms of transport takes place. But let's first speak of consumer convenience. Now, how does one create an ecosystem uh, which makes it convenient and economical to own and run an EV? So consumers who complain about having to spend five minutes at the pump are certainly going to complain even if the fastest flash charge involves half an hour of waiting at a charging station. So there are various things which have been discussed about, you know, can underground automated battery swap stations eliminate waiting time for charging? I mean, that, that is one of the solutions. It makes, you know, far better use of land if you push, push them underground. You can reduce the dead weight of batteries which an EV car has to carry. But to do that, there's a lot of work on standardization of batteries which needs to come into place. And those, those standards have to be built. Again, there is, I think, a lot of room for innovative startup models that can segregate and enable distributed ownership of batteries and battery-related energy services you know, on lease, rental, or tolling models. You know, that entirely disrupts the entire concept of how you're going to be energizing your vehicles. You know, there is no reason why, uh, with blockchain technologies, car owners need to really own batteries at all. Cars and charging stations could resolve payment and service charges between them with minimal human interface. But there is a second bigger challenge 
which faces the EV industry, especially in a country like India. One that on the face of it actually seems a far bigger challenge. But I think in that challenge lies our biggest opportunity. See, this is the ch challenge of making a transition to an energy system that will integrate electric vehicles into not just a transportation system, but actually transform the energy grid that is going to fuel them. We all know electricity is clean, but the problem is electricity itself is only a carrier. It is not a primary fuel. And for, you know, for, for example, when one keeps giving the way the example of Norway, Norway hopes to end sales of the internal combustion car by the year 2025. And 60% of all cars sold in Norway in 2015 were actually EVs. But then let us not forget that 97% of the grid of Norway actually runs on hydroelectricity, which is itself a clean source of fuel. What does one do in countries where 80% of the grid is actually coal-based? You're only transferring the problem from the tailpipe to somewhere else. You're not really solving the problem of emissions. You're not really solving the problem of pollution. So how does one move? How does one transit? When one starts talking of the actually, I call it an inevitable transition and a transition that must happen to transportation systems which have zero emissions. That is absolutely mandatory, we must do it. So how is that to be done to make it really effective and a really sincere effort, not just a matter of slogan shouting? No, that is what we must address. So the thing is that if you have something like a hydroelectric grid, which Norway has, it is very easy to ramp it up and down in response to supply and demand, because demand keeps on fluctuating. Electricity fundamentally is like water. You can, when there is greater demand, you can run more water in the canal. When there's less demand, you ramp it down so that you don't end up wasting water and don't end up in the case of electricity, burning out the entire electricity grid and making it collapse. So balancing that grid becomes extremely important. India and most countries today have extremely ambitious targets for renewable energy. You know, you've, you've heard that everyone is taking, talking about the, the, the solar emissions, that we're going to be adding more and more solar capacities. In, in the last five years, actually, India has not added any new conventional fossil fuel powered capacity. It has only added solar and wind-based capacities. Now, that is, that is a shift which is happening the world over. But the problem arises that if you are adding more and more intermittent sources of energy, like wind and solar, then there is a real risk that once the supply in the grid moves beyond 10%, the grid can become unbalanced because of the intermittency factor. Their storage of electricity becomes extremely important. And electricity needs to be stored in order that the grid can be balanced on and off. And that is precisely where the win-win solution for the entire EV industry really lies. Now, EV batteries, whether they are sitting in cars, whether they're sitting in charging stations, can actually provide the backup to meet peak load requirements, which also then generates EV owners or charging stations the kind of revenues when you're feeding back power into the grid, you're actually being paid for that power. So it a, helps balance the grid. It moves you into a situation where you can then start running more and more of electricity actually on renewables and raise the bar from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 percent of actual power in the grid. And it is, it is actually a complete symbiotic win-win solution for both sides. So EVs then become, an EV ecosystem then becomes a means that enables the integration of even greater wind and solar capacities making the entire grid go truly green to approach zero emissions overall. And yes, tailpipe emissions, also zero. Generating stations emissions, also zero. So you're really moving on to a grid which is universally a zero emission grid. So this, these are the directions which are really, I would say this is a new model T Ford waiting to happen. This is the future which we need to be moving towards. But 
these require not slogans. These require policy intervention. These is not, do not require declarations saying we'll have all electric vehicles by 2030. It's, it's, it's not just the planning commission we need, to, we need to say that. You need a hard, solid roadmap because there are going to be 100 moving parts which need to move in coordination, in tandem with each other to make this possible. Because ultimately, you see, no public exchequer in the world, if you start talking about what kind of support the government should be giving. No public exchequer in the world has the funds to make this transition through public money. It is just not possible. But a transition like this can be made if policymakers lay down very, very clear milestones you know, across the whole, the whole system with clearly defined goals and points where certain parts of industry have to move to a certain order to a certain, certain different standard, to a certain different technology. That is what creates certainty in the minds of investors and consumers as to where they're going to be at a particular point of time. Because what confuses them is uncertainty. Now, 15 years ago, India moved to shift its public transport to natural gas. It did it in so many cities. And policymakers pushed out all around to drive that change. Now, today, investors are again confused. On the one hand is the accelerated introduction of BS6 standards uh, for uh, IC engines. And auto, auto companies are being asked to put in massive amounts of money into making this transition, into transiting to be developing BS6 compliant engines, which means upfront capital investment. At the same time, you have declarations coming saying, no, we will be all electric by 2030. Now, this creates complete confusion in the minds of investors, in the minds of everyone who is part of the EV ecosystem or any auto, auto, automobile ecosystem. So that's what I'm saying, that if you have a clear roadmap which is planned and rolled out then with confidence, then what it does is it catalyzes the energy and dynamism of a million people, you know, some of, the, some of who are in this room. There are so many things which can start happening. Now, there are all kinds of... It, because it, this, this, is, this is such a big Herculean project. So have that roadmap in place, and the field then is set for a thousands of startups, entrepreneurs, and investors down the entire value chain, which EV is going to bring with it, which is going to mean a lot of jobs, a lot of new employment opportunities, right down from the servicing to the battery station, to the charging stations, to, to, you know, to the entire service industry, which needs to build up around, around the EV framework. So that is something what is needed, not just by the EV industry. I think that is something which is needed by the country at large. It is needed by society. It is needed by humanity. And this is something which is needed by the planet itself. Now, thank you. Wow.